So very welcome everybody uh, to our second and third edition of our mini series on um, technical art history and the application of advanced imaging technologies to cultural heritage artifacts organized by Elmer Hermans, our visiting professor, but now uh, here in Venice, but live on, from, uh, uh, from Scotland actually. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm very happy that we have such a high number of participants from all around the globe. And especially I'm grateful to our presenters today that will be shortly introduced by Zemilla. Uh, um, before I hand over to Erma to introduce you to this mini series, which is um, uh, uh, in sharp contrast to the fact that uh, uh, these are presentations of projects that are highly ambitious and uh, really um, uh, very advanced uh, um, cutting edge research in the field. So I'm very glad that Erma, uh, you organized this event together with the Rijksmuseum and the CWI group for uh, advanced imaging and the Center for Venice, uh, the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities. Um, um, this event is being recorded and will be published uh, on YouTube. So please be aware. So we want you to participate. There will be a discussion after uh, the second talk for both talks, uh, but be aware that uh, you, you then will uh, go uh, online in some way uh, with this recording. Please use the chat for sharing information, links, questions. And uh, I try when I moderate or me and Erma uh, moderate the the discussion, then we follow also the chat, chat and um, give you also the uh, opportunity to elaborate on your questions and comments. Okay, that's all I have to say, uh, I think. So my name is Franz Fischer and I hand now over to Erma. Thanks Franz, well you, you said, um, I think I'll keep it very short, you said uh, uh, our... Oh, we lost you, your, your microphone. Sorry. Thanks, friends, um, very much. Um, yes, this is a, a series of four seminars um, organized by uh, a group of uh, um, researchers from uh, indeed uh, CWI in Amsterdam, Rijksmuseum, and uh, together with the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities. Um, we've had a very uh, successful session uh, two weeks ago uh, on which uh, a blog has been published as well on looking through artblog.wordpress.com, um, which might be very nice to, to have a look at with lots of links there. And um, the session was also re recorded, so you can still see it online at the website from the Venice Center, the YouTube channel, I should say, from the Venice Center. Um, so without further ado, we, today we have uh, two very fa fantastic talks um, where artificial intelligence and um, imaging um, meet this, this masterpiece of the Gent, the Gent altarpiece. Uh, and uh, I will uh, hand over now to Zemila Zero. She is a postdoc uh, in computational imaging at the CWI and she will introduce our first speaker uh, for today. Jamila. Thank you very much, uh, Erma, uh, for the nice uh, intro, as well as uh, Elisa, uh, Franz. Um, so yes, it is with a great pleasure that I introduce uh, Professor Pijurica, whose work is a constant uh, source of inspiration for the community. A um, few words. So Alexander Pijurica uh, is professor in uh, statistical imaging modeling at uh, Hens University, where she is also leading the research group, um, Artificial Intelligence and Sparse Modeling. Uh, in this talk, she will discuss the application of AI to the hand uh, altarpiece with emphasis on automatic detection of cracks, uh, paint losses, as well as overpaint detection and virtual restoration. So uh, we can't wait to hear uh, these details directly from you, uh, Alexandra. So the stage is yours. Thank you very much, the organizers, for the invitation. It's real privilege and honor to be here with you today. And thank you, Jamila, for this generous uh, introduction. So I will now share my screen. It should be. 
let me just go to the full screen mode. I hope it succeeds. <laughs> Please let me know uh, if, uh, if it is okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So as uh, Jamila introduced, my talk will be on the application of artificial intelligence in art conservation, preservation, and in particular on our experience from working on the digital acquisitions of the Gantt altarpiece. Let me first just briefly introduce my research group. So we are a group for artificial intelligence and sparse modeling, and we are part of the Department for Telecommunications and Information Processing at the Faculty of Engineering and Architecture at Ghent University. Um, I like to say that our research is at the intersection of signal image processing, machine learning, and information theory. Well, we are basically developing algorithms for processing also high dimensional data. A lot of these are actually applied like to hyperspectral imaging and remote sensing is an important application for our research. And we are developing also deep learning models for processing these high dimensional data. Also, we are dealing with reconstruction of images from incomplete data, and in particular, their medical imaging is an important application domain, like this uh, reconstruction of magnetic resonance images. And uh, also, of course, the application to art investigation, and this is uh, a long uh, ongoing, let's say, topic in our research group and one of the most important uh, topics that we address. So let me now just show uh, briefly. So this is our research group with some photos taken just before the outbreak of the corona pandemic. I will be talking today about the applications of AI in uh, the digital painting analysis. Of course, the AI uh, techniques and computer vision uh, have been applied extensively to support conservation and restoration treatment of the masterpieces, and which is the topic that I will be covering today. But we also apply these techniques to support the analysis of paintings. I will mention something very briefly if, if the time allows. The, uh, here, these images are actually details from the Gantt altarpiece. And um, so here we see the altarpiece, the outer panels of the altarpiece or when it is closed. And actually, this is already the panels that have been restored. And uh, here we have the view on the inner panels of the altarpiece. Recently, the uh, last restoration campaign of the Gantt altarpiece uh, has finished, which lasted from uh, several years, from 2012 to December uh, 2019. And this restoration campaign was actually um, ongoing in the Museum of Fine Arts in Ghent, in this studio behind glass windows, such that the public and the audience could see the restorers in action. And the whole restoration campaign uh, has received huge attention in the media. So this is just one of the uh, titles from, in this case, the New York Times, but actually all the newspapers, bigger newspapers and magazines and media followed this restoration campaign step per step. We have been fortunate to work closely with the restorers who worked on the Gantt altarpiece. <clears throat> so here, Bart de Walder, who recently moved to Princeton uh, Art Museum, and Helene Dubois from Kik Irpa, Actually, they provided a lot of input to our research. I will show later on some of the annotations of the ground truth and that they uh, provided, but also they guided us to the problems that are relevant to address and helped in the validation of the results. Of the uh, first phase of the 
restoration of the Ghent altarpiece is designated as the phase that was devoted to restoring the outer panels. And actually a surprise from this restoration campaign was that a um, huge part of the altarpiece was overpainted. And in fact, about 70% of these outer panels were overpainted. And so these are all these areas that are denoted here in red. And these have been then the overpaint was removed in order to reveal the genuine work of Van Eyck underneath. And in this process, after removing this overpaint, um, at many places, um, actually different details appeared beneath the Achean, um, let's say, uh, painting a structure which is most uh, most of the times kind of more dramatic than the one that was overpainted like you can see here in the folds of this dress of the Elizabeth Borlut panel but the most striking and actually most spectacular finding was actually the face of the lamp and the Achean face of the lamp is much more expressive and also much stronger and more dramatic than the one that was overpainted. While removing this overpaint, of course, various paint losses and lacunas also uh, have been uh, discovered. Well, this was also the reason why, uh, uh, in the first place, why uh, the, there was overpaint. And this was the first problem that we were actually pointed to by the restorers. So they asked us whether we could develop an automatic method for paint loss detection. It turned out to be very useful to have such a method for the restorers because they needed to document the state of the panels, of the percentage that uh, was damaged. And this was a kind of uh, very time consuming and not so interesting <laughs> kind of work, uh, tedious. And the semi-automatic tools that are available actually also require a lot of manual work and allow only relatively rough annotation. Also detecting accurately the areas of paint loss is necessary if we want to perform automatic virtual restoration, which can also be used sometimes to uh, support the decision making process. So uh, this was the uh, let's say the first task that we addressed, but then also in parallel, uh, another problem that was important to both restorers, art restorers and art historians was the problem of crack detection. Well, detecting cracks is crucial uh, for paintings. It is a kind of like main uh, approach to make the diagnosis of the state of the panel, but also the changes in the crack patterns can indicate possible places of overpaint, simply because in the areas that have been overpainted, the crack detection pattern is developing in a different way. Uh, also, crack detection is very important as input for virtual restoration. And in this case, this is, is particularly interesting because uh, in contrast to repairing the lacunas and larger parts of missing paint, the art, art restorers will typically not fill in the cracks during the restoration stage. So the only way to see the painting in the way as it appeared uh, centuries ago before these damages uh, are, uh, arose could be by applying virtual restoration. And indeed, this is also interesting for art historical aspects in certain places, especially like here where there are inscriptions. And I will come back to that later on. We faced various challenges in this process. Well, first of all, we are dealing here with huge data. The 
painting and the panels are acquired in huge resolution. But then also, uh, as I will show later on, it is necessary for these various tasks that we address to use multimodal data acquisitions. And then when we have these multiple modalities, they are not perfectly aligned, although our image processing or machine learning methods, computer vision approaches will assume that these images are perfectly aligned, which is very difficult to achieve, in fact, in practice. And then we are also, for practical reasons, dealing with scarce annotations, which are also inevitably erroneous because uh, of manual work. Here, I just want to illustrate the problem of paint loss detection because sometimes just looking visually like, so this is an enlarged uh, detail of the panel Prophet Zachary. And so here for our visual system, it is relatively easy to recognize the areas of paint loss. But in fact, for a computer vision system, this is quite difficult because uh, just by <clears throat> looking in the color of this paint loss, uh, it uh, is often very similar or the same as the color of some painted features. And this is illustrated here by this scatter plot where I simply took some uh, points, uh, some pixels from the areas that are affected by paint loss and those that are not. And you can see that they are not actually linearly separable. So for this reason, we had to use multiple imaging modalities and we used the modalities that we had at our disposal. Uh, some of these were acquired before the restoration campaign started even years ago, like X-ray images. And then uh, we had also various imaging modalities acquired during the restoration campaign, uh, optical images, macro photography, infrared, macro photography, infrared reflectography. So basically these were the main types of imaging modalities that we had. And our first step was to register these, so to align them perfectly. Now, this, this is, can be seen as a kind of a chicken and egg problem, because uh, if you want to, uh, let's say, uh, perfectly align these uh, imaging modalities, then you will be able to more accurately detect various landmarks, such as cracks, and on the other hand, we need those landmarks to better align these images. We indeed used crack patterns as landmarks for registration. This was more most robust. And what we did is that we first roughly, not roughly, but we detected cracks separately in different modalities relying on the fact that many of these will reappear across different modalities and then we use those to register the images. Then from the registered set we were able to better detect cracks, then we repeated registration and in such an iterative way we obtain more reliable registration of these images. I will show some examples of uh, paint loss detection, in particular on two panels. And so these are both panels from the outer side from, uh, of the uh, Gantt altarpiece. So one of these is on the John the Evangelist panel and the other one on the Prophet Zachary. So here you see the enlarged details. And these are the annotations I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that uh, we obtained the manual annotations of paint loss areas from art restorers, in particular Bart de Wolder made these annotations here in different areas. So here are these patches are denoted and then you can see one of these enlarged and the annotations that, that, that the restorer made. So we had also similar annotations on this other panel. And we used those annotations later on to train our machine learning models or sparse coding methods or deep learning methods. 
The annotations were done on the visual image, but in the actual processing for our automatic, automatic processing, we use these various imaging modalities that we had at our disposal. Now I will not go into technical details of the methods, but I just like to underline some main concept and many of these techniques that we developed are actually based on the sparse representation. So what we mean by that is actually that you can imagine that here this like this bar is some vector some of uh, or, or some array of values which are let's say taken at a particular spatial position across all the spectral bands in a hyperspectral image or across all the modalities or it can be also one small image patch which is then taken in some raster scanning fashion and then vectorized in such an array. And then we uh, want to learn a dictionary of atoms or prototypes. Each of them has the same nature as these input samples, but these are some building blocks from which we want to represent each and every possible input in a sparse way. And when we say sparse way, we mean that this input sample will be represented as a weighted sum of relatively few, let's say here, three elements from such a dictionary. Here you can see an example if this dictionary is made for image patches. So, well, in this case, uh, what, what I showed in the previous slide were vectorized patches and here we can see them how they would uh, look spatially. And then if we learn a good dictionary, then we will be able to represent every small patch from an image that shares the same characteristics with the training set in a, uh, with relatively few elements, with relatively few atoms, like here, a linear combination of three atoms from this dictionary. This is a very powerful concept which can be used and which is extensively used in computer vision and machine learning. We, um, I will illustrate later on how we used it in the restoration and in the detection of paint losses. But just as a small detour, let me also say that this approach uh, can be also used for attribution. So uh, suppose we have a set of paintings for a given master and then we learn a dictionary, so a representative dictionary of image atoms for this master, for this artist. In, in that case, when a new painting comes in for which when the attribution is not certain, uh, we might want to represent this image in the dictionary learned for a given artist and then depending on whether we are able to represent it well and when we say well meaning sparsely uh, or not this can tell us something about how likely it is that the new painting uh, is indeed um, comes from the same artist. Now, another concept, well, when we are talking about these dictionary learning methods, I don't go into any details there, but typically to learn such a representative dictionary, we need a set of, um, let's say, paintings from a given artist, and then we need some iterative procedures to learn such a dictionary. But we can also use alternative approaches, which are also widely used in both remote sensing and we use it also quite a, a lot in digital painting analysis. It's a concept called sparse representation classification. It is also another, let's say, beautiful theoretical idea which comes from this seminal work of Wright and collaborators, which is already quite old in the meantime, and uh, where let's say, suppose we have certain annotated samples from different classes, let's say here from this green class, blue and yellow, and then we can construct without some complicated learning procedure, simply from these annotated samples, we construct a structured dictionary. Once we do that, 
uh, then when we have a new sample coming in for which we don't know to which class it corresponds, we need to solve the so-called sparse coding problem mathematically. I will not go into uh, the details how, how this sparse coding problem is solved, but suppose we solve this problem, then we obtain the coefficients, the optimal coefficients of the representation. And then using these coefficients, we can calculate what would be the error if we would represent this input sample, but each of these sub dictionaries separately. And then by looking into which of them gives us the smallest error, we can assign the input sample to the corresponding class. So conceptually, this is a very simple approach. And indeed, we apply this method to the uh, analysis of paint loss and to detection of paint loss. So here, uh, let's say we have some annotations from the experts about what paint loss is or cracks or other background areas which are neither of the two classes. And suppose we have such a dictionary which consists of the three components, three possible classes. We have a new pixel for which we want to determine whether it is paint loss or not. Now we solve the sparse coding problem and then in uh, the way I just described previously, we look into the errors corresponding to each of the sub dictionary, and then we decide to which class to assign this input sample. Well, in reality, there are some other technical details here, but basically this is the main idea. So here are some examples uh, while detecting the paint loss using this method. I will show later on also the result of in painting because indeed this is something also interesting. How can we, uh, let's say, evaluate the quality of paint loss detection? And uh, one way is actually to apply virtual restoration. We applied also deep learning methods to paint loss detection. Well, in this case, we have here, let's say a deep convolutional neural network, or in particular here, it was the so-called UNET architecture. And you can imagine this is a model where you have some, sometimes millions of, um, uh, let's say some nodes that you will be tuning based on the difference in the predicted output and the desired output propagating the error signal back and tuning all these nodes in this huge network. And then once the training process is completed, we are able to run it pretty fast and to obtain the probabilities that a given pixel in this case, let's say belongs to a given class. So here is an example of running this method also on paint loss detection on the John the Evangelist panel. Well, um, we compared our different approaches. I must say the deep learning approach is perhaps less elegant mathematically. Uh, in the our sparse coding model, we know exactly precisely mathematically what goes on at uh, every stage. And here it is a bit less. So although these models are not entirely black box, uh, let us be clear on that. But uh, still we were uh, amazed that we were able to uh, rel relatively fast um, obtain the results which were comparable or better than the methods obtained by sparse coding. And the, particularly the advantage of these methods are that they are very fast once trained. So we are able to process huge panels here for this 6,000 by 7 and 5,000 image. The processing time was less than a minute but this is already a result of a couple of years ago, so it is even faster. And uh, we applied also related techniques to crack detection from paintings. And so this is a problem, crack detection, that we addressed also for a long time with different methods. I will just show here the results of deep learning approaches. 
And um, actually, to our knowledge, we were the first one to report the application of deep learning to, uh, to crack detection uh, in paintings. Although deep learning has been applied widely to crack detection, let's say, in road surfaces. But this is much easier problem because when you look in this case, the background is relatively uniform, cracks appear similar, while detecting cracks in paintings, it's really challenging because, well, we can have like here bright cracks on a dark background or dark cracks on a bright background. They can interfere with painted features like hair, eyelashes, background constantly changes and so on. And also um, what we observed in the Ghent altarpiece, at least in the panels uh, of the Ghent altarpiece, is that we had to use multiple imaging modalities in order to detect all these cracks. Because some of them appear, let's say, quite clearly in the visual images, like these ones here. But then some other cracks we can see more clearly in the infrared imaging. But there are also cracks that even in the infrared images like uh, were not uh, pronounced and not, not well visible, but they were much better detectable in the X-ray images. So we combined all these modalities and fed them at, as the input to a deep learning model. This was again based on a deep convolutional neural network. We also worked several years actually on these models and developed several variants. Uh, there were various technical challenges to solve there, but I will skip those. And if you are interested, you can look at this um, recent paper where actually we explained various details about this deep learning crack detection approach. Here are some results just while well, showing again comparison with a more traditional Bayesian crack detection method that we were developing for years before. And um, this Bayesian method has been trained particularly on this panel while the deep learning model was trained on different panels and we just used relatively few annotations to retrain it. And so we were pretty satisfied with, with this result. I mentioned at the beginning the importance of crack detection for art historians from the point of view of improving the readability of the inscriptions. And in fact, this is one aspect that we have been dealing with since the beginning of our work on the Gantt altarpiece. And that was actually way before um, the current restoration campaign started. No, we were still using the old images from the Dirich collection at that time. Um, actually, the, um, the problem of interest to art historian is this book in the panel Annunciation to Mary, because it is not clear, even today, it's not clear entirely whether this whole text is... Um, all real text or just some combination at some places, some real words and some other, and just uh, some calligraphic characters. So in order to improve the readability of this text, uh, we wanted to detect cracks and to perform virtual restoration. And now having these deep learning models, we are in fact capable to detect these crack patterns much more accurately than we did before and in a fast way. I will show later on the result of in painting, but um, I'd just like to, um, if I still, have some time, but I would like really to ask you to give me a sign if I'm going over time. I would like to briefly mention this case study that we did on the central panel of the Gantt altarpiece. So here on this panel adoration of the mystic lamp, there were on the back side of the panel 
wooden reinforcements placed and the borders of those reinforcements you can see here with these red re rectangles. And then during the restoration campaign, the restorers thought that this could be actually a, uh, the right moment to remove those reinforcements, if ever. And there were hypotheses that perhaps they might have caused some mechanical tension simply because their direction was perpendicular to the direction of the wood grain in the panel. And so we were provided close-ups, so these enlarged images um, uh, around the reinforcements. So it was Helene Dubois, the restorer working on the Gantt altarpiece, who actually provided us those images and asked us to uh, detect cracks and to look whether there are some changes there around these reinforcements. So what we did, we trained our deep learning model. So this is an example showing you how this training uh, goes on, actually giving some examples of what the cracks are. So here in green, examples of what, what are the cracks and in blue examples what the cracks are not. And then uh, training this model, now these are just some enlarged parts of the crack map. And uh, what we observed, so by computing some simple heat map, which shows the density uh, of the detected cracks, we could observe that indeed uh, at the positions around these sharp corners, it seemed to be somewhat increased density of the crack maps, uh, well, in, in these heat maps. So um, this might have supported hypothesis that uh, certain mechanical tensions, not, um, let's say, uh, uh, not particularly important, but that, that certain small mechanical uh, tensions might have existed there. And indeed, these reinforcements were removed during the restoration phase. Now in the uh, remaining uh, several minutes of this talk, I would like to briefly mention also then the restoration virtual restoration, because so far I showed the examples how we detect paint loss, how we detect cracks, but it is also of interest to perform virtual restoration of those. And the approaches that we apply are based on the so-called patch based in painting, which means, well, suppose that this is a damaged patch where there is this, in this black is crack, detected crack. And so Basically, so how we will solve this problem is that we will search for candidate patches throughout the image, which are similar to this damaged patch, such that we can combine the undamaged part from these uh, patches in the rest, uh, and to restore it in that way. Again, this is an oversimplified the way how I explain it, but this is the main idea. So um, here in this red uh, color, we denote the detected crack that needs to be filled in. What is here with this dark brown are part of those letters from the book of the Annunciation to Mary. So it's a huge resolution. So this is just the enlarged part of the letter. And um, the green squares are centers of these patches that we want to correct. So uh, basically for each of these damaged patches, we will allow to have multiple candidates. And then you can cons uh, think of this as a kind of solving a puzzle. Uh, we want to, from these multiple possible candidates, we want to put them um, such, uh, to arrange them such that they agree well with the undamaged part of, the, um, of this patch and that they also agree well with themselves. So that you can find details about this approach again in the corresponding paper. I will not go to technical details. I will just say that we spent quite some time on this problem uh, also to solve it in such a way that we ensure that these structures of the, these letters here are 
uh, properly connected so, such that we don't fill in this crack with the background but that we continue the painted structure and then for this we needed various strategies of how we select the candidates in which order we do in painting and so on so coming back to this book that i uh, showed a few times. Uh, here we see on the left the original book with cracks. This is the um, scan which was done before removing over paint because it is the stage and that we did the crack detection uh, on this panel. And here the in-painted book, I will show the enlarged part. And so here you can see that um, Actually, and it's largely due to the fact that we had very accurate crack detection, we were able to uh, remove and in-paint these various cracks, but also to, pre to preserve some of these thin lines, which are not cracks in, in, in fact, but, but are actually painted features, which look like cracks. So we were pretty... Um, proud with this result and the art historian and the re restorer uh, were satis very satisfied with it. So we also have, I don't mention here, but uh, we, we did publish also before uh, works on this and where it turned out that actually after this virtual in painting, the deciphering of this text was facilitated and a few fragments have been uh, deciphered, a few additional fragments. And uh, some other examples of virtual restoration of the Prophet Zachary detail. And here you can see again, so uh, actually this whole process starting from the image after removing over paint then automatic detection of paint loss and automatic in painting. And here enlarged parts, so the detected paint loss in painted, but what was interesting is that actually we could compare the result of our fully automatic process of virtual restoration and the result that the restorers obtained during the physical restoration. Uh, well, when you uh, compare the, uh, the two results, you will observe that our fully automatical approach still suffers from some problems. So here, this line of the neck is not ideally smooth. There are some small problems over here, but uh, overall, this uh, approach um, resembles quite well the physical restoration. So large parts of this um, research that I presented is also included as a chapter in this recent book, which is a very nice book, uh, which covers various aspects of the uh, art, uh, art history, iconographical aspects of the Gantt altarpiece. And so uh, I mentioned at the beginning, I started from uh, mentioning the restoration campaign that has just uh, recently finished, but actually in this restoration campaign, not all the panels were restored yet. So from the inner panels, only the bottom panels were restored and the upper seven panels uh, are to be restored in the next phase, which is planned uh, to start later on. Uh, so, in this uh, related to this, I just wanted to briefly mention there are other aspects of uh, of um, uh, our work which are related to the analysis of characterization of the painter's style, and in particular analysis of painted pearls. And I'm mentioning these because actually these pearls are indeed pronounced in these upper panels of the Gantt altarpiece. In the, these are details of the panel, uh, singing angels. And um, so uh, we are, uh, we have developed some kind of approach, which is able to, let's say, extract some kind of dig digital signatures of the painted pearls and characterize these. And we are planning to continue this research further on with the more recent deep learning methods. And in this way, both continuing the 
uh, efforts supporting the restoration, uh, conservation treatment, and the analysis, we uh, hope to be ready to support even better the next phase of the restoration of the Ghent altarpiece, which is supposed to start from 2022. And indeed, not only Ghent altarpiece, but uh, also we do hope to, uh, let's say, uh, also collaborate uh, on other masterpieces. So by this, I want to thank you for your attention and I will be glad to answer questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Pizurica. It was uh, extremely uh, interesting to follow your talk. It has been uh, really astonishing um, to, to follow your, uh, your presentation and it's particularly interesting to track trends and evolution uh, of, for instance, uh, crack detention, uh, sorry, detection uh, from semi-supervised Bayesian approaches to demi, so to deep learning on the, on the Ghent uh, altarpiece following your publications. Um, and uh, yes, so thank you very much, uh, Alexandra, for your talk. And I would like to um, leave uh, the stage to uh, my colleague, uh, my collaborator, um, Nushka, uh, the Kaiser, and her introduction to Hirt. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. I also wanted to start with uh, congratulating you, Alexandra, because it was an amazing talk and you give a great overview. But I think we can uh, can now also go to the second talk in uh, view of time. And uh, I have the great pleasure to present you uh, Professor Geert, Dr. Geert van der Snicht, and he's a tenure track professor at the University of Antwerp in the Conservation and Restoration Department. Uh, as a cultural heritage science, he specialized in synchrotron radiation-based analysis and the application of chemical imaging techniques for the non-invasive characterization of paintings and art materials. And uh, today he will kindly present us the results of an extensive research he conducted on the Ghent altarpiece, uh, like Alexandra Pizurica, as well as other uh, works by Van Eyck. So I would like to give the floor now to Geert. Thank you, Nushka. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to first see if I can yeah. share my screen. Uh, Alexandra needs to stop sharing because okay. we still see her screen. Alexandra, can you stop sharing? Uh, yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just trying to find the option. Uh, um, at, the top, at the top. At the top. I think now you can also interrupt that. I think I was. I, I don't see the option. I just see the option for for new share. And I'm, I'm sorry. Maybe you I'm... can, uh, uh, Alexandra, have a look at uh, your uh, Zoom uh, window, and you would see exactly. Oh yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I was in the full screen mm -hmm. mode. Uh, no worries. Yes. I, I would like just to remind the audience that if they have any questions, they are more than free to <sighs> to ask them already in the Q and A, and we will uh, handle them at the end of the uh, ah, at I... the end of Hirt's uh, session. I am sorry, but again, I don't see the option for. No, no, that's it's fine. fine. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. We have solved this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you uh, for inviting me, and also uh, I thank the previous speaker for an excellent talk, um, and I invite you to have a look at uh, with me at some more images of the Ghent altarpiece. Uh, these images are a bit different than the ones that Alexandra was looking at or focusing at in the sense that these are not purely uh, visual images. These are chemical images and we collected a lot of chemical imaging uh, in the past few years uh, together with, uh, with uh, the team of uh, Access and Arches. Uh, so I also like to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Professor Janssens, PhD student Stanley Grand and um, Dr. Frederik van Meert, who uh, they gave a lot of uh, support to this, uh, to this chemical imaging campaign. And uh, you see some of the images here rotating. Um, and well, this is a visual one, but as you can, or, or at least as the chemical symbol in the, the upper left corner gives away, the, the, they have a chemical meaning, these images. So they tell us something about the composition of uh, the paint what pigments there are, what painting materials were used, and where you can find them on uh, the panels. Um, 
me see if I can go to the next slide. So you probably recognize the image, it's the central panel, it's the adoration of the lamb. And um, as Alexandra also mentioned, uh, all these images were uh, recorded during the previous phases of the conservation treatment. Uh, phase two is com was completed recently. And uh, the first phase was uh, completed a few years ago and that focused on the reverse side of the wings. Uh, so you see here the hand altarpiece with closed wings. And um, the, the, the conservation, the long conservation campaign was of course an excellent time window to try uh, several scientific methods um, to see how uh, useful they are in the process of uh, conservation conserv or conserving uh, a large scale uh, work like this one. And most of the imagery that was collected is, is for you easy to consult on the website Closer to Van Eyck, hosted by the Kikirpa, which you see here. And what you can see on this magnificent uh, website is a compilation of the traditional imaging techniques. So these are the, the, the techniques which are uh, often a lot or, or, or used almost at a routine basis during conservation. So you have uh, macro photographs, infrared macro photography, infrared reflectography, and X radiography, which you can explore there at an uh, unpreceded uh, high resolution and detail. Um, but um, all these techniques, they, they supply us with a wealth of information about the structure and the buildup of the painting, but they have some limitations in the sense that we are looking at panel paintings and, and, and normal paintings, they are should be considered as highly complex objects. And so we are used to look at the surface of the paintings, but in fact, they're very three-dimensional. So behind the, the, the top surface layer, there are always a, a large series of layers which we cannot see visually and which hide a very complicated uh, buildup. And as you can see here, this is a typical scheme of a possible uh, layer buildup of a painting. And you can see there can be quite some layers and quite some materials present there. And during the, co the conventional imaging, you use several kinds of electromagnetic radiation, such as X-rays, infrared, visual light, ultraviolet light uh, to make photographs, basically. So you project this radiation onto the paintings and you just take a picture or a photograph uh, with a sensible or, or with a useful sensor to collect uh, imagery. And um, like I said, it gives a lot of information, but it also has an important drawback. And the major drawback here is the fact that in these images, the, the conventional images, they give us uh, all these layers, all these materials processed or projected in one single flat image. Uh, so you can imagine, I hope you can see my, uh, my pointer. For instance, if you collect an image here, then all these layers will contribute to some extent to the, the flat image that you record. And so that, that can make it quite uh, tricky to interpret these images correctly. And therefore there is a, a need for a, a kind of imaging with a higher selectivity. And so in the sense that you can better separate the materials or that you can better separate the layers from each other. And that is where the macro XRF scanning comes in. And so macro X-ray fluorescent scanning is the the complete name of the technique. I uh, usually talk about macro XRF to make it a bit more easier um, to pronounce. And um, you see that there is macro in the name. Macro is there to uh, separate or distinguish it from micro scanning and to stress the fact that we are uh, focusing on large areas, entire paintings, uh, for instance, for the reverse side of the wings. Uh, this was a paint area of about eight square meters. And it took us 37 experiments, 37 scans to cover this area and a total of 60 days. So that is more than two months uh, of scanning that we needed to cover the area of uh, the backside. And I'll explain later why it takes so long to do this. And then, of course, the, the, the core, or the heart of the technique is X-ray fluorescence. That's an analytical chemical technique to analyze materials. And to understand how this works, we have a look, can have a look here at the measuring head of the scanner. 
and you see there is in the middle there is an x-ray source x-ray source produces x-rays and uh, projects a very tiny beam of x-rays onto the paint surface as, as you hear symbolized by the arrow the x-rays will interact with the paint and with the materials it will penetrate into the layers and then the material will uh, emit radiation secondary radiation which is collected by an x-ray detector so it is actually fluorescing uh, radiation back into the detector and this detector will then uh, tell us what materials are there the question is if we do that how do we transform all this data into images and to understand that i would like to illustrate that with uh, another example it's my classic example for those of you who have already seen it i apologize but it is so far the best example to illustrates or truly show the added value of macro serif imaging. So I'm, I keep using it uh, to clarify how this technique works. So here it is in our laboratory, the, the painting or the portrait. How does it work? Well, you have to imagine when we perform macro serif scanning that we divide the painting virtually into pixels. So a lot of small squares. And in each of these squares, we perform one chemical analysis, one XRF measurement. And the result is an XRF spectrum. You see, it's a kind of graph. You see peaks, and these peaks, they tell us which chemical elements are present in that exact pixel. And of course, we have a lot of pixels. We can choose the size, but it's not uncommon that we have about 1 million or more pixels uh, to analyze. And so we perform on a painting like this, for instance, two and a half million of chemical analysis. And that is the explanation why it takes quite some time to uh, to collect these images. Uh, of course, we cannot look at all these spectra, all these graphs uh, by hand, uh, as, you, as we do it here. Eh? Um, we do not look at each spectrum. We have software to do that, which will process these uh, spectra in a semi-automatic way. And uh, what does this software do? Well, the software will go through all the pixels, all the spectra, and it will identify all the elements which are present. And so what are the chemical elements present in this, in this painting? And um, a second thing, it will also calculate the peak intensity. So it means that it will look at the height of the peaks for each element. So for each element, it will make a separate image and it will look uh, where the, high, the highest peaks are and where the elements are lacking. So in other words, we make a contrast image and uh, we start coloring, or the software software will start coloring all these pixels separately. And it will look, for instance, for LED, where the pixels are with the highest intensity, with the highest peaks, and they will, and the software will give that a white color. Uh, pixels where the element is lacking will be left uh, black, and everything in between gets a medium intensity uh, value. And in this way, we build up an image. And it probably will be more clear if I show you what the image looks like. And this is the LED image. So it means that it will show us the LED distribution. In other words, you should look at this image as a bunch of pixels, and each pixel has received a gray value. And so the areas where there's a lot of LED, which is mostly related to the pigment LED white, will show up white. And so the book is white here, which means that there's a lot of lead white. So that makes sense. And because the x-rays go deeper into the paint stack, we also see features that are hidden below the surface, such as this little boy. There is an arm here. There is something else here. And you will probably say, well, this looks a bit like a radiography. It looks a bit similar than a as a traditional x-ray radiography. But the nice thing is that we can look at all the other elements. So instead of just one image, we have a whole series of 10 to 15 images that we can study. And for instance, we can look at the mercury distribution. Mercury is associated, of course, with the pigment vermilion, a red pigment. And then we see the flesh colors appearing. And we see this boy a little bit better. There's another boy. There is a hand. There is a face which is mixed with the face of the, the current sitter. And we can also look at cobalt and we see the blue dress of Mary appearing. So that means that there's probably a blue pigment called smalt that was used. We can go a little bit further, make it a bit more intuitive and give them a nice color like I did in the opening slide. And if we all paste it together to a composite XRF map with 
cobalt in blue, vermilion in red, brown, and uh, lead in white, then we see something like this. So we get a quite good image or good idea of the hidden composition. So the composition which is hidden below this portrait of a sitter. And uh, this is clear enough to hand it over to art historians and the art historians can try to interpret that and give a meaning to this image. And if you do that, uh, to if you give this image to an art historian, they come up relatively quick, quickly with this composition by Del Sarto. Uh, it looks quite uh, similar, but there are differences, of course. So you can continue to compare, and uh, this is smaller. So it's definitely not a one-on-one -on -one reuse of a cartoon as was done as in, uh, in the studio. Uh, if we, for instance, make an overlay of the contours and we project that on the, the original Del Sarto image, we see that's quite accurate, but not 100%. So it's probably uh, a copied by a transfer grid, for instance, and not by a cartoon. And in this way, you can give a meaning to paintings like that. But I think the added value of XRF imaging becomes especially clear when you compare it to uh, the traditional X-ray radiography, which you see on the right side. And you, I think you will agree that we see the image of the composition a lot more clearer we can get information on the colors, which is not the case for a radiography. We do not know what the colors are. We know that the dress is blue, for instance. Uh, by identifying the elements, we can tentatively do a dating eh, because there is smalt in this blue dress. That means that it's probably a painting dating from the 16th to 17th century. Um, we get information on the condition. This is also very important because you see here on the left, all these black spots in the composition are actually paint losses. So we learn from that that the painting was quite heavily damaged when it was overpainted with the portrait. So that is also a very important issue for uh, the Gent altar piece, to which we will return very soon. And maybe the most important uh, added value is the fact that we were able to translate these very complex chemical data, this spectra and this graph into comprehensive images. Huh? So these are images that anyone can interpret and understand. Uh, so it is a lot more easy to co collaborate with conservators, with curators, art historians, etc. Maybe that is even the most important um, advantage. So now that we know very well how XRF imaging works or what the basic concept is, we return to Ghent and the Ghent altarpiece we see here the skyline of the medieval city center with the three towers. And uh, the Ghent altarpiece was, of course, meant for the Cathedral of St. Baba, which you see here on the right. There's also the belfry and the church of St. Nicholas. It was installed in the Cathedral of St. Baba in, uh, in 1432. And it stayed there. Well, it doesn't really, it didn't stay there, but it's still there when we are 600 years later. So when the conservation treatment started. And maybe that is even the most remarkable thing. Uh, if you see what happened over those six centuries, uh, it was stolen, it was traded, it was mutilated. It's almost a miracle that it's still there in the cathedral where it was meant to be. So all the panels were dispersed and in the end they came back. Uh, to the cathedral, except for the panel of the just judges, of course, which was stolen in the 1930s, and the predella, which also got lost. When we first visited the cathedral there uh, to see if the imaging, the macro XRF imaging was possible, that something like maybe 10 years ago, uh, not only the, the again, altarpiece was under restoration, but also the tower. And you can see the tower was in full scaffolding um, during the restoration. And there was an, interesting. there was an ad, an advertisement of uh, come and see the Ghent altarpiece. And this uh, triggered a practical joker to climb the scaffolding and steal the panel of the just judges once again, which I very much appreciated this joke. And for those who are not familiar, the, the panel was stolen in the 1930s and it is a bit, has become since then a mystery, a kind of monster of Loch Ness of uh, Flanders, so to speak. So um, let's have a look what happened inside the cathedral. I have made a small movie. I hope it will work. Uh, let's see if I can get it up and running. 
if something is happening you can if it doesn't work you can also find it on youtube okay it's it's there so it's a time lapse of these first tryouts we did inside the cathedral and you see me and my colleagues here hard at work and you see for the occasion conservators took off the panel of the deity the central panel and mounted it against uh temporary against a wall and we are building up the scanner uh, to, to, to do the first test. And you see it takes some time to do the testing. Uh, when it's finished, we can align the instruments to make sure that it is working very well because it will take a long time. And then at a certain point, we're ready. The scan starts. You see we disappear for having a beer and we wait. The scanner does his work. Then we return after the beer to see everything is working well. Looks fine. We go for the second beer. We go home and the scanner just keeps working overnight. So it becomes dark. Scanner does his work. Takes a long time to collect the data. And in the morning, we return and we do basically the same. Let's wait. OK, this is the morning. We reposition the scanner to cover Another area, we do again the alignment, we start the scanner, we go for the beer, scan is started, and we wait until it's finished. This is a small uh, detail image of the scanner in front of the deity. You understand why the aligning is very crucial. We're measuring quite close to the paint surface. Of course, there is like a uh, there is like an emergency stop in case it will touch the painting, the scanner stops automatically. And then the final day we had a, a special tryout. We did a test on the mystic lamp itself, which you see from a different angle. So we are inside the showcase with bulletproof glass. So this thick black thing here is actually the glass. Scanner is working and here on the right you see uh, the people who can visit the cathedral and can have a look at the scans. So this was before the reinstallment of the of the okay there are the uh, there is myself and my colleagues and let me see if I can go to the next slides. Yes okay so that was the tryout it worked very well we had the first results and after that the panels were brought to the Museum of Fine Arts as Alexandra already mentioned and they were treated so not in the cathedral, but they were treated in the museum where there was a better area for treatment. First thing which was done was removal of the thick package, the thick stack of aged varnish layers. And you can see what the impact was on the colors. As we have here, the, the aged varnish, which is yellowish, brownish, very strange color. This is a gradual removal. And here, the varnish is completely removed. So this is already a big visual impact. But then um, the discovery of the overpaint was the next big thing. And once all this varnish was removed, the conservator started to get the impression that there was quite a lot of overpaint. And like Alexandra mentioned, up to 70% of the surface, the paint surface was overpainted. And you see here a detail with very nice cracks that Alexandra will very much like, I guess. A uh, very clear crack, crack pattern. And what I'm more interested in is not the cracks, but the overpaint that you see this grayish thick crust. This is actually the overpaint with big grains inside. And this was mostly covering the area of this uh, apostle here. So uh, this extent of overpaint was never suspected from the 50s on. That was the last conservation treatment. Uh, it was clear that there were overpaints, but not nobody expected that much of overpaint, of course. Um, so there was the first dilemma for the conservators was, yeah, should we remove or should we keep the overpaint? And that's already a very big question uh, to answer, not only from a deontological point of view, but also it will it would have made the conservation treatment a lot longer, a lot expensier, expensier, expensive, sorry. And so it was uh, uh, at that time they were calling in the help of the micro XRF scanning to see if we could say something more about these um, overpaints. And then next question, 
after the dilemma of removal of conserving, another big parameter to consider was, of course, the condition of the hidden paint. So here, this uh, original paint looks quite good, but you don't know exactly how it looks below the other layers. And so the question here was, can Macrux RF imaging supply more objective arguments to decide? And the two challenges were basically, can we confirm the extent of the overpaint? Can we visualize the overpaint? And can we also estimate the condition of the hidden paint? So the original paintings by Van Eyck, are they still in a good condition? Because it, of course it doesn't make sense to remove all the overpaints if what is below there is very damaged and needs a lot of uh, retouching. So these were the two challenges for macro XRF imaging. So we collected the images there, like uh, these are similar as the example that I showed on uh, the portrait, uh, with the difference that they are not so spectacularly uh, diverging from the paint surface. And that is because, of course, the overpaints, they follow the forms and the original colors of the original composition by Van Eyck. So in other words, uh, the phase is the same. There is no other phase below the painting where there is red paint. It was overpainted with red paint. So the differences are not that very clear. Um, so it was a bit more challenging than the example of the portrait that I showed earlier on. But when you study long enough to, especially the high energy images like mercury and lead, small differences started to show up. For instance, there were a lot more highlights in the dress of, um, of uh, Jos Fett, the donor, for instance. And we saw small differences, sharper outlines, which all gave us the impression that the contrast of the original painting would be much higher. So there would be a stronger <clears throat> difference between light and shadows, especially in the folds. Okay, but the most intriguing part or which gave us the smoking gun on the fact that there was actually a painting below the surface paint layer was the visualization of paint losses. And I will exemplify this by looking at uh, the sleeve here of Elisabeth Borlut. We will look, have a look at this small detail. And before treatment, it looked like a pristine paint layer. So the paint layer is perfect. There are no paint losses, except only some cracks, but no really damages to this area. When we look at the LED images, so the LED distribution images, we get two images. We see here the LED M distribution and the LED L. And especially in the LED L, we see clearly paint losses, gaps in the paint layer, which we do not see at the surface. If we look at the LED M line, we see a paint surface, which is very similar to the top layer. So you might be confused now. What does it mean? We are looking at two times the same image. Yeah? So it is the distribution of LED. And then again, we see a different distribution. The one on the right is showing paint losses, the one on the left, not. How is it possible? Well, for that, we have to have a look at the XRF spectrum and the LED L uh, image is collected from these peaks, which have a high energy. They are about 10 to 12 kilo electron volts. While this image, the LED M is collected from LED peaks around 2.3 kilo electron volts, so light energy. What does that mean? It means that this image is showing us only the top surface layer, so only the LED, which is present in the top surface paint. Because it has a low energy, it cannot penetrate to uh, over layers. So it can only show us what is on top. The LED L image, shows us an image or shows the X-rays with 10 to 12 kilo electron volts. So they can come from deeper inside the paint stack. So they can penetrate any layers which are on top. So we look at the layer, at the layer which is deeper inside the paint stack. So what can we conclude? Well, there are clearly two LED containing paint layers on top of each other. There is one with paint losses and there is one without the paint losses. So we have at least a double paint system there. Next, we see that the deepest layer is damaged. That is clear. That's what we can already conclude. 
And you know there are more, right? there are more elements to look at. Also, another element of interest is iron, iron at six kilo electron volt. And the iron shows us areas which match the paint losses. And how can we interpret this? Well, we interpret this, this as fillings which are were applied in these gaps, in these small pits in the paint layer before it was overpainted. So before the, the, the 16th century artists who overpainted the composition, um, before doing that, they leveled the surface by applying something which a material that contained iron. And iron makes sense because you can correlate that with hematite, a reddish type of uh, pigment. So the color of this uh, filling would have been similar to this color. And then a final element of interest here in this context is the copper. The copper distribution follows what we see at the surface. So in other words, there is in the top layer, uh, there is a, a part from the lead, there will be also some copper. And that's also not so, so strange because in areas like this, which are typically, this color is typically an organic lake pigment, we often find azurite, blue grains of azurite, which are added to the, uh, to the color of the dye to give it a more burgundy, morgundy, more uh, purplish kind of color. So we can conclude from these two images that there is probably a reddish lake on top containing azurite, and it makes sense uh, because old overpaint, uh, in, in, um, it makes sense that there is azurite, uh, which means that it's an old overpaint. That from 1700 onwards, uh, other pigments were used uh, to uh, give blue colors. Okay, if we can start by putting all this information together, we can start trying to make a reconstruction of the paint layer buildup. So we know we have a wooden panel it's always calcium based prepared. So there is glue and chalk on top of that. And then we have the first layer. Right? We, we know that's what we see here, that this is a layer that contains lead and probably an organic lake. So this must be, or we assume that this is the original layer by Van Eyck and it has gaps. It has holes in the paint surface. These holes, they were filled with an iron based filling, probably reddish brown. That's what we learn from this image. And we also see that the fillings are a bit bigger than the actual holes. So they were applied with some overlap. So they did, they did not really match the gap. They were going over the edges of the gaps. And then finally, we have another area that is the top, uh, that is the top layer, the surface layer that we saw uh, before the conservation treatment. It contains lead, it contains copper, and probably a red lake, which we cannot detect with Markovic serif imaging. So this gives us uh, what we can reconstruct from the XRF imaging. So by deducing and putting together this information, we have a hip hypothesis. And when you have a hypothesis, it's good to confirm this. And we can confirm that by taking just a few samples or in this case, consider the samples, reconsider the samples that were already extracted in the 1950s. And you can see here a sample from this taken from this area. And then you see we have a preparation layer. We have an original paint layer. We have an overpaint. And in between, we didn't know that from uh, the XRF imaging, but there is a varnish in between. And this is what is really good news for the conservators. If you want to remove the overpaint, this varnish gives a kind of buffer. Right? So it makes it easier to separate the overpaint from the original paint. The samples were also uh, analyzed by Jana Sanjova at the Kik Irpa. And so you get SEM images. And these, the, these, these images confirmed our XRF, uh, let's say, reconstruction. And we have two layers containing lead, and the top layer is containing copper. So that was quite good. Uh, let's again compare with traditional imaging, X-rays here, infrared reflectography there. Well, in the X-ray radiography, we basically see the wooden structure with the cradling on the back, uh, but not really the gaps. 
Well, if you know where to look, if you have seen the micro serif imaging, you will see very vaguely here a small uh, paint gap. But it's difficult to interpret. And then the infrared reflectography shows well, maybe vaguely something here, but it's not very clear as well. I hope you agree with me that the micro serif imaging was clear in this case. Okay, so that's a detail. Let's take a step back and look at the overall panel. And when we look at this panel, we see here on the left the distribution of lead and the distribution of iron. You know the distribution of lead gives us a very clear image of the exact size of the paint lacuna. And so the exact gaps in the paint layers. And you see there actually, there are a lot of them. They're all quite small and discrete. So the condition of the original paint is quite good. If we look at the iron image, we see where or how these gaps were filled. And you will notice that these infills, they were really applied relatively abundantly. They were really spread over much larger than the small gaps that we saw in the lead image. Okay. So we get an idea of the condition. The condition was overall relatively well of the original paint. It was not perfect, but at least it was a lot better than what was expected. And these were, uh, let's say, objective chemical uh, arguments that could feed the debate on whether to remove the overpaint or not and how to proceed with the conservation. So they, these images, they were not the only argument, but I think um, they played a crucial role in the defining the conservation strategy. So all of this, uh, you know, we, we already know now that it eventually led to the decision to remove all the overpaints and to bring back to the light or bring back to light the authentic brushwork by Van Eyck. It has a big impact, um, not only on the visual experience, uh, because the quality of Van Eyck's original paint layers is a lot better, which we know now, and now that it's all been removed. But it also has a big impact on the treatment in the sense that the first phase was, uh, was longer. It took two years, two additional years to remove all the overpaints, and it added about half a million euros to the budget. So that was quite an impact just for phase one. And the impact for the second phase is, of course, uh, similar. OK. So let's have a look to the removal. Once, once the decision was made, the conservators started removing step by step, very gradually, the overpaints. Uh, and you can see this was done uh, very um, precisely under a microscope. You see here Marie Postek at work at the panel of the Donorios fat that we saw earlier. And uh, we can have a look at uh, the work in progress. Uh, this is a detail of uh, the red cloak or the red garment of Jos fat. It's during the removal. Here there is some overpaint left here at the bottom. So below the dotted line, the overpaint is still there. In the other areas, the overpaint is removed. And you see, for instance, uh, this is a, a shadow in one of the folds. And you see that it more or less stops abruptly in the overpaint. So the, the person, the artist who painted over didn't really follow the shadowing with uh, the same sense of detail as Van Eyck. You see it also here. This shadow here in the fold of the dress was not followed into the overpaint. So this is explains why these uh, paintings after their treatment look so much better. Eh? The contrast is a lot better um, before, uh, after the treatment than before. Also interesting is to uh, have a look at the, the paint gaps, eh? or at least the paint gaps that we identified in our scanning. And you see they're actually filled with this reddish iron-based material here and here. So we more or less predicted quite uh, exactly what the conservators would encounter when they would take away the overpaint. And you can compare it here. This is a composite XRF image. In white, there is lead. In red, there is a distribution of mercury. And in green, there is the iron. And so you see here, there's a lot of damage and infills in this area. And we are looking actually at this uh, detail. And so 
these green small green patches are actually these infills uh, that were discovered. Okay, for some of the panels, we revisited them when the conservation or the cleaning was halfway, uh, just to assess in what way that XRF scanning is also interesting to document actually the ongoing treatment. You see here a detail. This is a detail of the dress of Borut. And you see it, uh, part of it was uncovered and part of it is still overpainted. And you see it here at in, in this stage in the lead, in the copper and the iron distribution. And you see definitely the copper signal is disappearing while the overpaint is being removed. And so we see that this copper that we uh, that I discussed earlier on, it's only there in the overpaint and it disappears when the overpaint is removed. Same for the iron infills, and most of them here are already removed. So after cleaning, so they disappear during the scanning. And then there is a little remark to be made. Uh, there is, uh, if you look at the LED image, we could uh, identify all the big gaps, but you see, if you compare the left to the right, that after cleaning, there are a lot more very small damages that our scanner did not spot. Uh, so for instance, these all these very tiny damages they do not really appear in our um, XRF imaging. But still, the conservators were pleased with the results, uh, and and we, I think it, it's also the micro XRF imaging has also some uh, use as a documentation to, uh, to to document really what is happening while paintings are in the process of conservation. Uh, I hope I still have a little bit of time. Then I want to say something about the other uh, paintings by Van Eyck that we've been scanning. As Alexandra mentioned, we are waiting for the third phase to start. And we filled the time gap with scanning other paintings like these in Bruges. Here we have the Van der Paale painting in the Groningen Museum in Bruges and also the very small portrait of his wife, Margaret, uh, which we scanned in detail. And I'll just throw in some results uh, about the portrait of Margaret, because here the interest is not really for the conservation. And the panel was treated several years ago at the National Gallery, Gallery in London. So we were not really interested in revealing uh, overpaints. We were more interested in the paint layer and the technique of Van Eyck, and it also yielded some interesting results. So on the left, on the right, you have uh, the LED image. And the LED image, you can see how Van Eyck had some second thoughts on the folding of this intriguing headgear of his wife. And you can see here this uh, tip of the fold was removed. It's not repeated in the, in the painting. Also here, there are some changes. There are some changes there. And then at some point, apparently, the, the cap or the headgear also covered the ear of Margaret. So there are a lot of pentimenti to be seen. An interesting one. Is the, is the fur here, the lining of the, of the garment of uh, Margareta. So there is this grayish fur, which in the beginning was a bit different. It was more smaller, more modest. And it's also interesting to see here on the bottom that it gives, the LED image gives the impression that the fur continued where the hands were. And indeed, if you look at the hands, they're a bit awkward. Eh? They look a bit too small. They're, the position is a bit strange if you, if you really Pay attention to the hand, so it's there's an, an idea that something was changed there, and it becomes more clear when we look at the mercury image. Uh, so the mercury shows the red pigment vermilion, and then we see that there was actually no hands at all in an early painting phase. And I have the strong impression that the hands were actually tucked inside the sleeves, which makes it a look like, look like a lot like this painting, which is in uh, the Metropolitan. You see here a portrait, probably of Isabella of Portugal, who is a bit uh, is a bit in a similar position. And you see she has her hands inside the sleeve with the fur lining of the sleeves touching each other. So I think it was a bit in this situation. But actually, there is something which is about this image, or which is actually more intri intriguing. It's actually 
giving us an insight in the earliest phase of Van Eyck. It's something which is very unusual that we see here. And that is, we are looking at the underpaint or some persons call it the dead layer. This is the very first layer that Van Eyck applied on the painting. And you see, he did that very coarse. Uh, that's the really the surprising part, uh, in my opinion. He applied this mercury paint with really a coarse brush, very wild brush strokes you see. You can actually measure it. I measured count by counting the pixels. It is a brush of nine millimeters wide, which is actually a very coarse brush considering the small size of this painting. And you see there are not, not much details, it's just a patch, a red patch. Only here some folds are indicated and that's it. And so this is something what very few people actually saw. The fact that Van Eyck applied his very first paint layer in a very coarse way. I'm also intrigued by this uh, feature here. We don't know exactly what it is. I have slightly the impression that it was, might be a fingerprint of Van Eyck who, who touches uh, the paint to see if it is dry. I think people who are painting themselves recognize this uh, when you touch a paint layer that is not dry yet. It looks a bit like that, but I cannot really prove it. I'm just guessing here. It would be, um, it's a nice thing to consider anyway. And then a final interesting uh, image is the zinc map. And zinc is for heritage scientists working on paintings. Uh, a uh, strange element to encounter in medieval paintings because it's usually something we associate with 19th century pigments, so modern pigments containing zinc white. But here we see it um, related to the dark, the deepest and the darkest color. And we have uh, the impression that it was used here as a dryer added to the, to the paint. And so the areas with, which are black and contain a lot of lake these are paints that dry not very well. And we think that Van Eyck added zinc sulfate to that. There was a PhD defense some time ago at the UVA recently by Indra Kneepkes who explored this, um, this approach. And she found um, in uh, all treatises, uh, she found recipes for adding zinc to oil paint to improve the drying. So it seems that this is what we are seeing here. And then just a final one, which I added, especially uh, for Alexandra. Uh, this is uh, a painting in Rotterdam. It's not, well, it's in, under discussion. Some people think, or some scholars think it is by Van Eyck. Others are very skeptical about that idea. But I'd like to draw your attention to uh, Mary in a blue dress here. Eh? And one of the reasons why it's not considered as Van Eyck is that the quality of the paint is not very well. And when you look at the blue dress, it indeed looks very flat. There's not, it's not very, um, very nice to look at uh, because these folds are not very nice, but it's actually due to the degradation of the ultramarine pigment. Uh, so ultramarine was applied as a transparent, semi-transparent glaze, giving blue color and much depth to uh, the folds. And when we look at the lead distribution, well, we see that the richness of these folds is still there, hidden below the degrading ultramarine. And so you see the quality of the paint was originally a lot better. And this is, of course, could be interesting to consider uh, digital or virtual paint reconstruction. So uh, if, uh, if Alexandra would have any thoughts on that, if she can feed this into any of her algor algorithms to, to to see how rich this uh, dress looked like, that would be very nice to do. And so I'm, I'm coming to the end of my talk. Um, what's coming up? Alexandra mentioned it. Uh, we're waiting for the phase three to start of the conservation treatment. That's bound to be very interesting because we have very interesting panels there. Uh, for instance, the deity and Mary and we are very interested in uh, the, these areas and the brocades because they are metal brocades there and they are highly degrading. So for people who are into chemical degradation of paint materials, this is going to be very interesting, uh, very interesting phase. And also not only from that point of view, but also because we have developed uh, some more scanners. Huh? So we have here 
an image of what was going on recently in the museum in Brussels for a Metox project, also together with the Kirpa, where we're looking for metal oxalates, another degradation product. And we see in the middle here the Marker XRF scanner at work. But on the left and on the right, we have new scanners. There is the macro FTR scanner and, of course, the macro X ray powder diffraction scanner, which is very relevant for give, seeing even more differences between materials and giving more um, uh, details on degradation products. Uh, this was very recently, this scanner this was introduced into the field, and we had some already some very nice results on, uh, for instance, the girl with the pearl earring uh, a couple of years ago. So I thank you for your attention. And as our national Belgian national hero, Tintin, already know, it's all about writing a very good article. And I hope you are, or at least I invite you to have a look at my articles in Science Advances and Angewand de Chemie. So uh, I hand the floor back to the coordinator. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Gert and uh, Alexandra, for this really fascinating talk. I'm completely, deeply impressed by, by your work. So thank you for giving us insight and making us um, looking through those layers of paints to detect these hidden stories of these paintings are really unbelievable. Um, so we have a lot of questions and um, uh, comments already in the chat, a lot of answers already by Alexandra, uh, thank you very much. I am not able to check boxes here, which uh, question has been already been solved and addressed. So I would suggest um, if um, yeah, someone is not happy with the answer already given in the chat to just uh, raise your hand or uh, give, give me a, a sign, me or Erma or Zimila uh, to, um, uh, ask or elaborate your question once again and um, uh, address it to, to the experts present here. So, um, yeah, the floor is open for questions. I won't read the questions already uh, written here, but if there's something uh, unanswered yet, uh, then please re repeat your, your, um, your question uh, with, uh, with the microphone on. No, I am personally very satisfied with the with the answers. They were all pretty pretty clear to me. So thank you very much again. Okay, you can give a, a brief summary, maybe of the, yeah, of sure. the discussion. Yes, sure. So uh, basically, um, I will uh, just uh, not go through the technical details that I've asked over the crack pixels. Uh, she um, she placed uh, beautiful links to her paper, so uh, I will go through to those uh, once the session is over. I think that uh, what was mostly, maybe we, what we could discuss briefly is that uh, I've asked her if she has um, quantitatively um, described the matching between her virtual restoration and what the conservator, conservator, conservators uh, did. So maybe she could uh, develop a bit uh, on that, uh, despite the fact that she told me already that uh, it was not uh, that vastly investigated, but maybe she could give us some hints of what she and her team uh, are planning to, uh, to, to do on that. Uh, thank you, Jamila, and also everyone for a very nice uh, questions. I mean, actually inspiring, uh, thinking uh, a lot of what needs to be done uh, further on and explained better. Uh, I think this is also one of these questions, very important aspects, how to evaluate these results. Well, also, I mean, how to evaluate the results first of paint loss detection and crack detection is already very difficult. And this is why I mentioned that there, for example, because we cannot have ground truth for the whole panel, for example. And uh, so this is uh, why, I mean, uh, one possible way to evaluate the quality of paint loss detection is through in painting, because if you detect paint losses in the wrong way, then you will see that, that errors propagate in your in-painted result. Uh, and then 
your question is even more difficult and how to uh, quali quantitatively evaluate the agreement with physical restoration. I think it's very difficult. I don't know, we are thinking about that because um, there are also, I mean, uh, I don't think this is entirely also possible to do quantitatively because there are certain decisions that are made also subjective during the physical restoration as well. Sometimes, let me just give an example because um, the restorers with whom we work, they told us, okay, the cracks themselves will not be in painted, but just larger areas of overpaint. But sometimes it's also how you define what is a larger area of overpaint, or sometimes even some of the cracks are in painted. And then I think this is a very important um, question. Maybe for some other area, definitely not using criteria just like mean squared error that we engineers or whatever are used to, but maybe some more uh, subjective, I mean, perceptual quality metrics. This is an interesting research direction. Yes, and I just would like to ask you another thing, since uh, I work with uh, Francine Bosma and Erma Hermans and other uh, collaborators that I do directly don't see in this frame. Uh, we work on the Impact for Art project, which is among other uh, uh, projects uh, based on um, CT scanners uh, taken at the Flexray Lab. And um, we have ongoing projects about CT uh, being super useful to detect um, inner um, fingerprints or uh, uh, cracks or um, or um, tree rings in in, uh, in in frames in in chests. And I was wondering whether um, analyzing uh, the hand altarpiece or any other uh, paintings that you may have would also be uh, yeah, valuable, you know, uh, just yeah. to, to track yeah. both in 3D as well as to discover other uh, yes, definitely. improve the pool for the deep learning exercise. So that's also yeah. something that we may think about. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, um, some of the problems that we addressed would not be so difficult if we had more of the imaging modalities. The fact is that you don't have them always at, um, at your disposal, but I mean, having the extra modalities like CT, I, I think definitely would be very valuable. And uh, not to mention also combining some of the modalities that Hert showed in his talk. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Geert um, about the zinc. Um, it seems very specific areas where it's, the zinc is uh, um, seen, but uh, thinking about the Gent altar piece, I mean, you have scanned quite a lot of Van Eyck uh, surfaces. So um, uh, can you connect it to specific other pigments mixtures where it was added? Uh, yeah, it's especially the lakes. It's it yeah, yeah. The, the, the lakes because that makes sense they, they dry very slowly um, and also the, the the black pigment so okay <laughs> which are also the slow dry, dryers of course yeah yes I see I see Nushka smile because we work together on black pigments <laughs> and and uh, uh, I understand there's also uh, a lot of gla ground glass found in uh, the paint layers and um, it's another thing we are also working on. So I was wondering if that that is something you can distinguish well with Macro XRF or if uh, because that is not always so clear to us. Um, what would you use to really distinguish ground glass from quartz, for example, or uh, uh, smalt that is discolored? Uh, of course, smalt still has cobalt, but you know, th these kind of different materials. Yes, a problem with glass is that it has is composed of mostly light elements, eh? so the glass yeah. silicium, uh, which is not really detectable with Macrix RF unless we would be scanning pure glass, for instance, like a glass window. I mean, then, then you would see silicium, uh, but we sometimes see it indirectly uh, when there is manganese in glass, eh? but it's often used mm -hmm. as a decolorizer to glass. And the manganese does show up sometimes. For instance, in the dove, uh, so the central dove of the, 
of the, the adoration panel, uh, there is clearly clear that there is manganese, as you see a manganese distribution in the dove, but you still have to know that it is coming from the glass, of course. But for, for estimating um, or studying ground glass, it, you, you still need samples in cross-section, I'm afraid, uh, to, really, to, to really look into that, yeah. I was hoping you would say something else, but we, we have the same experience. <laughs> yes, thank you. More questions? I have a very practical question. I mean, your work is so complex and so much data and people involved. How do you manage your projects? So how do you, Alexandra and Claire, communicate with the uh, restorators and with the art historians? And I mean, you, you have to work in loops, I suppose, I mean, because then the restorators create a new situation. So the image is then actually changing. And uh, do you then create a new digital or a chemical representation of, of the artwork? So um, I, 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 I would get panicked um, if, if I would have to control all these processes or define uh, um, a, a workflow. So how do you actually work together? I will maybe le uh, let Alexandra answer first. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I can say for us, it was actually pretty comfortable. I mean, uh, we were happy that um, the we are located in Ghent and the restoration treatment was uh, ongoing in, um, in MSK in Ghent. And so we had actually... Uh, most of the time, the restorers, Bart and Helene, uh, were coming for meetings to uh, our technicum. Sometimes we went to the museum, uh, sometimes per email. And then we also have a long-term collaboration with uh, an art historian, Max Martens, Maximilian Martens, who is also uh, coordinating a uh, large part of this project. So somehow, uh, I think uh, it went quite well, this, um, th this communication. Okay, and for, for the XRF scanning, um, it, is, uh, it is a tricky thing to do. The timing is very crucial, as you, as you mentioned. Um, in an ideal world, you would, world, you would uh, scan the entire panels uh, before the treatments and then um, and then maybe revisit uh, halfway the treatments and do a final scan at the end but in in practice it's not always possible of course to do that uh, to do that in a completely synchronized way um, but we 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 scan most of it before the treatments um, and um, um, we the, the nice thing is that it is it builds up, eh? so you you do a first scan, and then you get an, a, a general overview of what you're looking at. And in these scans, some things show up. Eh? Most of it is easy to explain, and then there are areas that need further uh, further research. And then in the next step, you just focus on these. And so you you work in a, in a targeted way. So it always gets more specialized and specialized. And it's also for this kind of treatments or for this kind of complicated questions that these new scanners will be very handy, will, will be more, um, will come really into play. Uh, talking about the handiness of, of the scanner. So in, in what way is it realistic to think about so a standardized uh, uh, digitization practice? So to, uh, I mean, there's so much to detect and to learn even about uh, images that are not maybe masterpieces, but to, to know the, these, these hidden stories in, in these images, to have a standardized digitization way. Is this realistic or is it, I mean, you need to drink a lot of beer probably to, <laughs> to run all these processes. What do you think? Uh, yes, the, the standard is quite it's difficult because there are a lot of you have a lot of parameters to consider, and eh? so a lot of parameters can can change. One of them is, for instance, the pixel size. The smaller the, the pixels you make, the higher resolution your images will be, and the more details you have. But the longer it takes, it, it uh, the the total measure time goes up exponentially, and only that parameter is also already making things complicated. That's one of the reasons why XRF scans are not into the 
closer to Van Eyck, for instance, because the resolution is completely different, um, except for small details. So we have uh, we have these these XRF scans, uh, which are very um, sorry. We have the radiographies, which have a very high resolution, of course, but then. Our, our mm, let's say our standard XRF imaging is a, is a lot more coarser. So you cannot just zoom in in the same way as you do it for a radiography. But we do that for, for the areas of interest, let's say. And so, yeah, that, that's already, already that, that one parameter is also is already preventing a real standard. Uh, and then you have differences in, in X-ray sources, types of detectors, et cetera. So it, it is a bit of a, a, an ad hoc thing, I'm afraid, uh, for the moment. Um, yeah. Thank you. More questions. We are approaching five o'clock Central mm -hmm. European time, but I mean, there's room for one or two questions, maybe. So don't be shy. Uh, I would like to ask the presenters again, if you uh, are willing to share your slides, uh, then we would um, upload them to our GitHub repository and uh, send an announcement via Twitter, Instagram, and whatever, through our social media, so people can go back to your presentation, or maybe you have already uh, presented uh, somewhere, and we just send a link or something. So I think that many people could take good use of this. Very gladly. Uh, I will share my slides right after. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, and of course, the, the lectures have been recorded as well. So that will uh, appear on the YouTube channel from the Venice Center. So you can uh, revisit that the, these wonderful talks. We've got some fantastic compliments for the speakers in the chat. So I'll pass this on to you, people very enthusiastic uh, about the talks. And we had an audience from all over the world, even from Brazil and Mexico City. So I think that is also really remarkable. So in two weeks time, we have our third seminar in this series. Uh, we will circulate it again. And so people can participate again. That is at four o'clock. So we start an hour later. Uh, so we do hope to see many of you again. Um, and please, uh, speakers, will will circulate the chat to you because there are some interesting comments also for uh, questions. And of course, a lot of very uh, uh, many thank yous for you both. Uh, so thank you, everybody. And um, we hope to see you again in two weeks time. And definitely thank also uh, the Venice Center and Elisa Coro, uh, who uh, has organized all the the technical elements here and made these beautiful posters for the announcements. Um, and of course, Zemila and Nushka for their wonderful introductions. So see you hopefully in two weeks time. Thanks again, Geert, Alexandra. Until the next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.